So it's been over a week since Nightingale revealed a whole bunch of stuff about how we'll create worlds. This brand new survival co-op crafting game is looking fantastic and it showed off how we're going to be able to customise the realms that we'll explore, making infinite challenges and variations. Since then, Aaron Flynn has done a whole bunch of interviews with IGN, WFT Tech, The Gamer and more, revealing oh so much more details and news so here is 25 brand new things or expanded info about nightingale let's go exploration isn't the only objective of the card system we've known that you can combine different cards set the kind of realm that you'll visit whether it be desert or mountain or swamp then decide if it's going to be daytime nighttime maybe the weather and what kind of enemies you potentially will face and it might seem obvious, but because of that combination, you will maybe have to use certain combos to get certain resources. So a particular mushroom might only grow at certain time at night and when it's raining in a specific biome. Every biome is going to have its own unique resources and the realm cards are going to determine which ones we have access to. The realm cards that we'll be using do have some sort of difficulty modifier. Basically, the more that you use, so if you add four or five, that means the realm could potentially be harder, adding more difficulty variables. Within each one of these realms, it will be procedure generated. However, the differences between your swamp and some other player's swamp might not be as big as we originally thought. Aaron said effectively there's only so much they can change. So expect to see the same kind of topography maybe, but maybe the ruins are in a slightly different location. Of course that's when talking about just one realm, when you combine the rest of the cards then it does make a unique experience. WF Tech asked if you find a combination of cards and you want to share that on Reddit, how similar is that experience going to be? And Aaron said there's going to be some variability in that, but over time we may find ways to get players to share the exact things that they want. So there could be opportunity for sharing precise exact combinations and worlds. But that will be a system that they will work on possibly during early access, so it's not a given for the launch. There will be co-op creation. You might have a card for a realm, one of your friends has a different modifier, and you can combine all of these cards to create a custom realm for yourselves. Nightingale isn't going to be based on persistent servers per se, in fact it sounds more like the Fallout 76 version of things. Effectively, you'll start a world, your friends can come and join. If you decide to leave, that world will persist without you as long as some of your friends are connected. Now of course, that is locked behind a paywall with Fallout 76, which is pretty horrendous and not really in tune with what a lot of us survival fans know and like from just dedicated or rentable servers. So I'm hoping that Nightingale is not going to go down that route and charge for that kind of stuff. But it doesn't sound like it. It does sound like that. It's going to be a core feature of the game and it will be a part of it rather than an additional pay. So it does mean you can create your own solo world and as long as none of your friends go ahead and join, you can log off and not have to worry about your base being destroyed by a giant apex predator. And again, that does open up questions of whether or not we're going to need more controls, even if we want to kick some of our friends to stop our world progressing too far without us. So this rules out peer-to-peer, -peer, which can often create a bunch of problems with lag and stuff, since obviously your system needs to be on for players to join in peer-to-peer, -peer, whereas this system is more, like I said, something to do with Fallout 76's membership options. So that all in mind, they did clarify that the game is not cloud-based in the slightest anymore. They basically got rid of all that technology that they originally had with their previous owners Improbable, but since they've been bought over by Tencent, they've gone to this new system. So it won't involve any type of cloud technology. Hence why the game changed from originally being a MMO style game with hundreds of players to something more co-op based. Aaron was asked whether or not you'd be able to play with your friends with this kind of session based gameplay across the world, that there wouldn't be significant hiccups and although they said they haven't really fully tested every kind of output with that, theoretically you should be able to play across the world with others with relatively no problems. The devs do have plans to upgrade to Unreal 5, it's currently made in Unreal 4 and it's something they'll investigate and look at in the future. So of course there will be a story, but given their roots with Bioware and other big game companies, don't take that to mean we're going to have half an hour conversations with NPCs. Aaron said there will be a bit of a story leading you through, trying to take you to find NPCs, take you on certain adventures, until you eventually reach the ultimate conclusion of that adventure to achieve some cool stuff. Base building is a core component of Nightingale, and it does look like we'll have the freedom to build anywhere we want. You will be able to build new bases in each realm that you visit. 
And this was clarified because we'd only maybe seen camping sites and stuff in some of the earlier trailers, but now it does look like it's more confirmed that you can build almost anywhere. It was also confirmed though that we will have a home realm, a respite realm, and this can be changed at any point as well, so I'm presuming we'll get more buffs at a respite home, or maybe it will reduce the kind of danger, or maybe that will be where we possibly will have to fend off against attacks. None of that was really clarified, but that's the kind of ideas I have around a respite, although the name itself kind of says that it's going to be free from danger. I guess hence why it might only be one respite realm at a time. Each realm is going to be around 2 kilometers by 2 kilometers. They didn't say 2 kilometers squared, so I'm presuming that is what the case will be. So that's about the same size as Assassin's Creed Unity's map, or maybe slightly more recent comparison about the size of a Yakuza map. So not going to be absolutely stonkingly huge, but they will obviously have varieties and different ways to customize them. Aaron was asked if there was any way to get across the maps, and Aaron said you've got your two legs, but we're not quite ready to talk about anything else yet. That says to me there will be some way to move around the maps other than your feet eventually. We do see airships in the latest trailer, that's an intriguing prospect. So there is going to be some sort of progression, or possibly skill tree, but Aaron wouldn't diverge too many details. There is going to be a character customization screen. You will be able to choose different types of clothing, certain colors, and the looks of your character. Or at least once you start playing, be able to change the colors and the looks of your character as you play. So that could lead to microtransactions for skins and stuff. And as long as it is only purely skins, I haven't really got too much of a problem with that. Although nowhere was it actually mentioned that they're going to have this kind of thing. They have stated clearly we won't ever pay for realm guards or any kind of boosters like that in the game. It does look like transmogrification will come into the game eventually. It's something they've been thinking about and they like the idea of, and something they'll probably work on during early access. Aaron has said that will spend most likely a year in early access, although this may be the minimum based on the kind of feedback they get from players and not improving and adding more content. Another feature they might look to add, but not definite, would be arachnophobia mode, as there is quite a large number of maybe big spiders in the game. Nightingale is going to be a survival light game, it's not going to be hardcore. There will be food, there will be water, but it doesn't look like the punishments for going without is going to be so severe as other games like Ark or Rust. So more than likely something along the lines of Valheim, where possibly only stoner is reduced, or you might have a slightly lesser health pool. Aaron spoke briefly about having inspiration from Destiny in how they provide content for their players and how that content ties in with progression. Hard to really gauge or fathom what he meant by that during the IGN interview, but I can only say it seems like possibly we'll need certain resources to craft certain transmogrifications for our weapons, the trinkets or the mods, and that might be something how you modify what a weapon can do or kind of output it has with elemental damage types. Or he actually means further afield that if it's success, they may introduce new content in paid expansions or free expansions in the future that may have some components of MTX. But it was an interesting comparison to talk about Destiny as an inspiration, which I hadn't seen before. Aaron was asked if he could complete the game by not killing creatures, as we know that we can maybe encourage the giant not to attack by giving him a reward or some sort of food. And that might be applied to a lot of the other creatures in the game. So would there be a way to get through the game? Aaron said he didn't quite know the answer. And he didn't want 100% say definitively, no, you can't. So it was something he checked back on. But he did compare that maybe originally Dark Souls, you're meant to have killed certain creatures. But players have done it without actually doing the no harm run. What that answer says to me is that there will be even more opportunities to stop or resolve conflicts with creatures than simply just putting a gun in their face. Aaron was asked how deep the crafting would be with weapons and stuff, and he did stress that it could go really deep in terms of being able to craft your shotgun, apply certain bonuses or buff, and then obviously making sure you're using rare resources to do that, magically imbue certain items with essences. And of course, alongside that, you will have to craft ammo. It's not going to be just a never-ending supply, and you will need different ways to get that ammo, but mostly you're going to need a crafting bench. You won't be able to craft just in your inventory. And that moved on to this next one, that a crafting bench may not be something that you can just pick up and pop inside your inventory, it will be something that you'll place down, and then if you do want to make a new one, you might have to just go ahead and craft a new one, rather than transport it. 
but you won't necessarily need a complicated base you will be able to basically craft these stations anywhere a lot of these last questions come from WF Tech, who asked some pretty interesting stuff. I gotta say, I preferred their line of questioning more than the others. And he basically asked, Would I be able to cheese enemies then? Putting a crafting bench down on top of a hill and then go ahead and shoot at an apex creature from distance with a rifle, full well known, I can just keep crafting bullets. And Aaron said, Yeah, that is potentially an option for you if that's how you want to take things on. So there we go, 25 hopefully new or expanding info about Nightingales. I'm really excited about this. I'm going to be doing my best to give you all the news guides and tutorials as we lead up to its launch course and when it actually gets here. And it's going to be, I think, the game of the year for me. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you like, check out the links to these interviews in the comment section and I'll see you, Ratbags, for more survival news soon. Bye-bye.